come now in our 11th lecture and handout theology to the subject of creation. I suppose for us, this is the second item in biblical theology. Once we recognize the existence of the divine trinity, the first thing that the trinity did that concerns us immediately is make these determinations or decrees we studied in the last lecture. And now the first step in the carrying out of these eternal decrees is the temporal act of creation. Creation usually means making something of nothing, which I, I'm afraid is the ultimate absurdity. To even God is unable to make something out of nothing. Three, if God made something out of nothing, it could not have been nothing. Out of nothing, nothing comes or is brought because there's nothing to come out of it or to be brought from it. For God can't square circles or make nothing something. More properly speaking, of course, it's not that God can't do it, but that there's nothing to do. It's a meaningless proposition. Five, besides, God himself is being infinite, unlimited. Other beings than being cannot exist independently of him. Speaking more properly, they have no being if considered separate and independent beings. Six, there cannot be being in addition to all being, or it, God, would not be all being. Seven, what then is creation? It must refer to the modification of infinite divine being. Eight, this seemingly obvious doctrine of creation is often resisted because it seems to spell pantheism. Nine, this is what seems to make the even more objectionable creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing, the only way out. It is another curing of a headache by decapitation. Ten, pantheism cannot be. Creatio ex nihilo cannot be, so it must be creatio ex Deo, creation from God. But don't ask me how that can be, but it seems to me it must be. Now let's look at this doctrine as I've presented it here, which I'm sure all of you will recognize is not the common understanding of creation. And I'm asking you to bear with me. I realize I'm in a decided minority of Christian theologians who have interpreted creation in this manner. And I may say personally, for the first 60 or so years of my life, I followed the customary, overwhelmingly majority opinion on this subject, but I have been persuaded that this rather strange view of creation is probably the correct one. And it's Jonathan Edwards who has shook me up on this one and settled me on a, another viewpoint. But like Edwards, with whom I agree on this, I'd say it's not essentially different from the other. And I'd say to all of you, if you can't accept this interpretation and prefer to live with the usual one, I don't think anything essential is lost. I don't present this as a point of orthodoxy or anything like that. It's not that serious, but one has to wrestle with the question of the creation by God, and the wrestling has led me to surrender to this type of viewpoint. I notice, therefore, in the first place, that creation usually, almost always, with most conservative Christians, means 
making something of nothing, which is the ultimate absurdity, I'm afraid. Creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing is what we usually mean by creation. At one time there was nothing, and God said, let there be light, let there be firmament, let there be this, and for the first time, being came into being as, and here the customary viewpoint itself tends to hold back and shrink back a little when it comes to ask whether these beings are then independent and existing of themselves. They don't want to say that. They will invariably say it. These beings God created are preserved by God and let the matter rest at, uh, at that point. But we observe in point number two, even God is unable to make something out of nothing. Three, if God made something out of nothing, it could not have been nothing. Out of nothing, nothing comes or is brought because there's nothing to come out of it or to be brought from it. Uh, you realize that's a pretty obvious statement. And uh, we realize that, uh, that even though it's customary to say this, it's a little embarrassing to explain what we mean by it. A magician brings a rabbit out of a hat we know it doesn't come out of the empty space because there's nothing in the space of a hat for a rabbit to come. Now, if God brought the rabbit, it would, be a, it would really have come from that area, but it wouldn't have come out of non-being because to have something as being, which isn't being, is a meaningless proposition. I know, of course, we immediately say, maybe meaningless for the magician, maybe meaningless for the creature, but it's not meaningless for God. But I'm afraid it is meaningless for God. Not that he brought something into existence, but that before that there was nothing, and then he brought out of that nothing something. I think you can see when you say it that way. In the beginning there was nothing, and from that nothing, God extracted something. That won't wash, will it? That can't be the real meaning of it. What we're trying to say, I think, in the piety and the conviction of our minds and hearts is that the existence of this created universe is owing to God alone. He wasn't dependent on anything else. There was nothing to help him, as it were. But when we get over to the actual doctrine, creatio ex nihilo, you see, that's saying more than that. That is saying from nothing, nothing comes. Now, nothing itself is nothing. That is, it doesn't even exist as a concept. It's a word without meaning. Because if you ever try to define nothing, you realize you've got something. As Edwards would say, Nothing is what the sleeping rocks dream of. Now I say, if anybody thinks he knows what nothing is, he must have rocks in his head. So you're talking about something which has no meaning, and if it has a meaning, you illicitly attribute it. And that something, then, is something out of which God creates rather than nothing at all. But I mean, I'm saying to you, and you're probably impatient here because of this departure from the norm, and I honor you for that because there's something admirable about the system of Reformed theology, and when you find this as an integral part, you're very prone to suppose it must be an indispensable part of the very pattern of thought. And for somebody to question it would disturb you, and you may well and legitimately be disturbed, but I say if you look closely at it, I'm afraid you're up against an unimaginable concept. 
and that we shouldn't actually be afraid of the notion that there are things that God cannot do. God cannot do. Now that does sound like a blasphemous utterance. God is omnipotent. How can I say, or anyone say, that there's anything that God cannot do? Well, God is a moral being, and the Bible itself says he cannot lie. The judge of all the earth cannot do wrong. We've already seen that God is a rational being, and I'm proposing that this concept of bringing something to being out of nothing is an irrational concept, and if it is, then you're not offended when you hear me say that God cannot do it, not because it really limits him, but because it's a meaningless proposition and we are not, if that be true, saying something significant about God. Number five, and this is the fundamental problem. It's built right into the Christian religion and its concept of an infinite and unlimited deity. Any other system of thought which entertains that idea of God, and that idea of God is inseparable from his definition. It isn't just that you learn this sort of thing in Calvin's Institute, you'll learn it in the Webster International or the Oxford Dictionaries. This is a part of the definition of God. We have no monopoly on it. It's just the way God is actually defined, that he is unlimited being. He is infinite being. Now, great controversy with those who wanted to talk about a finite God. We have always said, a finite God is no God. It's a contradiction in terms. To talk about an infinite God is a redundancy. There is no such thing as a non-infinite God. God is infinite. He's unlimited. All right, now that is, that's absolute orthodoxy. That is indispensable orthodoxy. That's a part of the definition of deity, and so on. And that's what I'm facing in number five and asking you, especially who have trouble with this interpretation, to weigh carefully before you reject it out of hand, which you may legitimately do. God himself is being infinite, unlimited. Other beings than being cannot exist independently, originally. Speaking more properly, they have no meaning if considered separate and independent beings. That agreed? I don't know how it could very well be challenged, as I say. It's a part of the very definition of God that he is infinite being. There is no other being if he's infinite. If there's another being that exists in addition to him or apart from him, then he is not infinite. Now, you know, as I say, to deny his infinite being, that is heresy. That's an immovable point. Say he's finite and you're not talking about God anymore. He is infinite. But what I'm asking you to feel now, and as it were, in your gut as well as in your brain, that he is infinite. If he's infinite, there can't be other being than himself. Is that not so? And if that is so, that certainly says something about the creation. We've already shown it couldn't meaningfully come out of nothing, and now we're saying it can't possibly be something other than being, which is God who is infinite. Number six, there cannot be being in addition to all being, or it, God, would not be all being. If there is other being, independent of him, in addition to him, he is a finite being. He may be 99 and 99 hundredths percent of all the being that is, 
and any other being than he may be infinitesimally small and insignificant, but it doesn't matter. It destroys his infinity. We no longer believe in the infinite God, and we are not about to do that. And if we're not about to do that, we do have a distinct and irresistible bearing of this fact on the nature of the creation. As being there, but it cannot be in addition to the all-being of God, or he would not be all-being uh, omnipresent. Now we ask the question in the light of all that, number seven, what then is creation? What is creation? It must refer to the modification of the infinite divine being. Creation is a reality. There's no disputing it. Nobody who believes in God disbelieves in his being the author of all that is, what we call creation. But what is the creation? What are these beings who seem to come into existence as other than the infinite being? Well, they have to be modifications of his being. They can't be in addition to his being, not only because there's no source from which they could come, but because it would make our God a finite God and no God. You understand, I, I, I know I'm laboring the obvious. I know this was plain to you five minutes ago, but at the same time I'm doing it because it cuts across the grain of our usual thinking so severely that you really must adjust even to understand what I'm saying. And you have to understand it before you either accept it or reject it. And I say the pressure on me that's dislodged me and may conceivably dislodge you from the usual way of thinking about it. You're not questioning creation, but it's a different way of thinking about creation is this double dilemma. It couldn't have come from nothing, and if it actually came into existence as independent of God, there would be beings alongside all being, and God would not therefore be all being. So this being has in some way or another to participate in the divine being, be what I call here some kind of modification of the being of the infinite being. Eight, this seemingly obvious doctrine of creation, <laughs> I have to laugh at myself at this, because obviously it hasn't seemed at all obvious to the generality of Christian theologians down through the ages, but as I say, when you look at this data, it seems to be awfully obvious. This seemingly obvious doctrine of creation is often resisted because it seems to spell pantheism. Pantheism means literally all is God. Pantheism. And of course, if all is God, and that includes the finite, and that includes the evil, that would force us to a concept of God, which again is indisputably blasphemous. It couldn't possibly be that everything is God and good and holy. That's what got Mary Baker Eddy into trouble, as we were noticing in the other lecture there, and so on. Because she couldn't see her way out of this, she got into this notion of denying that evil even existed, we know that's not a, not a solution, but this particular doctrine widely held around the world, and sometimes you've got people in the Christian church who virtually teach the same thing under this kind of pressure. But we know whatever the pressure is, we can't go here. 
This is untenable. For to identify everything with God in a way in which there are no distinctions has all those liabilities to which I have just referred. Nine, this is what seems to make the even more objectionable creatio ex nihilo the only way out. So we've got to make a creation out of nothing and keep it totally free of the being of God. See, I'm trying to explain now how this customary view, which is almost axiomatic in theistic circles, has come into an established, almost indisputable verity. It's because you can't have that. And it looks as if the only being is divine, pantheism is inevitable. So recoiling from that, we fall into ex nihilo creation. But you see, what we're doing here is fleeing from a lion and running into the arms of a bear, as the prophet talks about it in another connection. This has to be avoided. If this avoids it, if it's a creation ex nihilo, you have no danger with pantheism, but it has its own problems, such as I have mentioned. And between those two pressures, you have to come, it seems to me, to a notion such as I proposed here, the modification of the divine being. Pantheism cannot be. Creatio ex nihilo cannot be. So it must be creatio ex Deo, out of God himself. Don't ask me how that can be, but it seems to me it must be. Out here, in the area of very profound uh, mystery. A mystery so profound, there's virtually nothing much you can say about it except that this is where it would have to locate. And saying this, you maintain the indisputable infinity of God without falling into pantheism. Uh, and that's the reason, mysterious as it may be, it actually, seems to me, must be. In a certain sense, the psalmist prepares us for this sort of thing when he says, if I make my bed in Sheol, or hell, thou art there. You know that great psalm is telling us there's no such thing as escaping the being of God. Wherever you are, he is. And among other propositions, God is in hell. We know that quite apart from that psalm because he's everywhere. As we'll see in our final lectures in this series, it's not the absence of God from hell that makes it so terrible. It's the presence of God in hell. But you see, there's no place where God is not. In him we live and move and have our being, whether it's in hell, whether it's in this earth, whether it's in heaven. Wherever there's any being at all, it has its being in God. In him we live. We don't live except in him. Apart from him, we wouldn't live. We do live, therefore we are in him. We live, we move, and we have our very being in the all-being. But in such a way that being with God can be the object of his moral wrath in hell or the object of his moral pleasure in heaven. He is able to maintain his moral distinctiveness in a universe which participates in some mysterious way in his very being, and without which it wouldn't have any kind of being whatsoever. The reason we fear this doctrine because of its tendency toward pantheism and the obliteration of all moral distinctions, which we know is totally incompatible with the Christian religion, is overcome by the reality that's difficult to explain, but is incapable of denial, that even though all being has its being in him and is just a kind of modification of his being, 
and without participating in his being, it would have no being at all, it does not obliterate the rational or the moral aspects of the deity. And as I say, I don't know any way by which that is more pointedly and poignantly indicated than by this observation, we don't even escape God in hell. We're only alive in being in hell because we participate in the divine being. And yet God, the divine being, is infinitely blessed and everlastingly happy, even in hell, where his being is, who those who participate in his being know nothing but his wrath forever and forever. They say it's mysterious, but the evidence is there. And who can say that it's impossible to create beings, to allow them to fall, and yet let them continue their existence only by participating in the divine existence, and yet, as sinners, be the object of his wrath. See, that's the sort of thing that goes out with pantheism, but it remains in Christianity. It is absolutely indispensable. Let me just say in conclusion here, the... Um, this and really the discussion which follows on providence is, uh, it's an Edwardsian line and I'm not preaching because, I, because Edwards taught it but because I myself think it is true but it is definitely something you don't have to accept. The usual way of thinking that really means to give God all the glory for the existence of anything other than himself. That's the important thing. But when you do give a lecture on creation, as I'm called upon at this particular time, because no one can survey the system of doctrine taught in Holy Scripture who doesn't take into consideration the doctrine of creation. And when you think about what creation must be and is, I am driven to this conclusion. But I made it very plain to you, and I want it to be plain to you, that this isn't a minority opinion and in no sense indispensable. It just so happens that this teacher of this particular course feels that that minority viewpoint really does justice to the realities of the situation as the majority viewpoint with the best of intentions of honoring God and doing justice to his word, I don't feel does.